Good evening on behalf of Main Street Books and Charlotte Writers Club North. Welcome. I'm Beth Halfrich, Events Manager at Main Street Books. So with a few youthful exceptions on staff, most of us who work at the bookstore are in that bleary middle phase of life where we are so busy with activity and so far in the weeds and in the thick of it that it is hard to come up for air. Our, our brains and schedules are so full that it often doesn't even feel like there is time or space for simply remembering. In the past year of my own life though, life has given me some invitations to remember. The sudden and unexpected loss of my mother's youngest brother, the birth of our fifth and final child, the pandemic turning 40. <laughs> I don't mean to get too personal, but who are we really if not for our memories? And how do we really navigate the space between us once we realize that we can never know the all of anyone else? How do we live knowing that it all ends and always too soon? These questions keep appearing to me as of late and that is why I'm so thrilled to introduce our guest tonight because they are at the heart of her latest novel, Hieroglyphics. Before I welcome Jill McCorkle, a few housekeeping reminders. Number one, please stay on mute throughout the conversation. We would love to share your questions and I hope you have many of them. You can always type them directly into the chat and then I'll bring them forward for Jill. And lastly, if you don't yet have your own copy of Hieroglyphics, I have the paperback from the li or the hardback from the library at the moment, but the paperback edition is out and you can find it at MainStreetBooksDavidson.com or in the shop as early as tomorrow. And now it is my esteemed pleasure to introduce Jill McCorkle, one of North Carolina's finest writers and novelists, and one who has always found the time and diligence to write her way through what it means to be human. Her first new two novels were released simultaneously when she was just out of college. The New York Times called her a born novelist. Since then, she has published five other novels and four collections of short stories. Her work has appeared in Best American Short Stories several times, as well as the Norton Anthology of Short Fiction. Five of her books have been New York Times notable books and her novel Life After Life, which I think Hieroglyphics has a special nod to. We can talk about that later. It was a New York Times bestseller. She's received the New England Booksellers Award, the John Dos Passos Prize for Excellence in Literature and the North Carolina Award for Literature. She's written for the New York Times, Book Review, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, Garden and Gun, the Atlantic and many other publications. She's also a gifted teacher of writing and was Briggs Copeland Lecturer in Fiction at Harvard, where she also chaired the Department of Creative Writing. She's currently a faculty member of the Bennington College Writing Seminars and is affiliated with the MFA program at North Carolina State University. And just this afternoon, she led a workshop with our dear friends at Charlotte Writers Club. Welcome, Jill McCorkle. Thank you so much, Beth. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I had a wonderful afternoon um, with Charlotte Writers Club. I, I see some members. <laughs> um, uh, I'm still marveling um, that you're 40 and have that fifth child. I, I, think, I think I would have put you right out of college and uh, just beginning it all. So um, the trick of time. So uh, somewhere in some attic, you have a portrait getting older for you, right? <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. I, I, you know, the lighting here, if I, if I bend just so, <laughs> um, but I do, I, I, I love novels about time. I love novels, novels that really uh, focus on memory and storytelling um, and, and especially that get at the crux of what we can't ever know and understand about how it all works. Um, before we get into some questions, I would love to hear this in your own voice. And um, I know you've prepared a couple of passages. And so if you could start us off with reading um, a section from Lil, uh, that can get us started. I will. And uh, just to put in perspective, Lil is um, in her 80s and in the process of pulling together all the things she saved over life, um, letters, journals, um, she, a lot of the letters are addressed to her children uh, because in some ways she is editing life. You know, she's deciding what she does and does not want them to know. Um, so here's a little bit of Lil. 
we all are haunted by something, something we did or didn't do, and the passing years either add to the weight or diminish it. Mine have diminished, perhaps because I've spent time thinking about it all. It might sound silly, but I see these bits and pieces as my contribution to evolution, the unearthing and dusting of the prints and markers that led me here. Some seem to bulldoze right through life and up to their headstones, but I want to take my time. I want to find the right words. I imagine my recipient to be you two, or perhaps your children, and I hope this is so, rather than some stranger who comes in and hoists old boxes into a dumpster or rakes away the remainders of my life like the sad debris in the aftermath of a flood or fire. I'll never get over the sight of what we left behind at our home of over 50 years to move down here, a mountain of cast off things, old towels and linens, papers and books and shoes and pots, side tables and lamps, hoses and hose, packets of seeds I meant to plant, and a rubber squeak toy that had been safely hidden away in the back of my closet by one of the dogs long dead. And so much more, things not needed, things long forgotten, cans of cream of whatever soup and V8 juice, why, and peas that had sat there forgotten for years and things that never should have been there in the first place, like tuna helper or those things in my closet, like that geometric print mini dress I bought in the 60s hoping to look like Petula Clark or Judy Carn, a perky pixie kind of dress that I never had the nerve to wear and instead looked at it there at the back of the closet for years, along with a wiglet and a long frosted fall and some jackets with shoulders resembling a football player or Victorian monarch. We divided all into goodwill, consignment, recycle, landfill, but there were also the things I couldn't let go of, letters, reminders, souvenirs, and I'm taking my time, relieved when I find something that might have gotten lost in that mountain of debris, like one of your drawings from first grade or the stub from a movie I'd forgotten I even saw or a note from my father. When the moving van pulled away that afternoon and we got in the car and turned southwards, the space within seemed so empty, vacant. Our suitcases and silver chest in the trunk, an overnight bag and thermos of coffee on the back seat. And I had that terrible feeling that I had forgotten something because I was thinking of all the times the car was filled with you two your belongings, your music and voices, the dogs, while going to school or on vacation or just to the grocery store where I bought all of those things that I then put on the shelf there in our dimly lit pantry on the red gingham contact paper I spent one snowy afternoon 40 years ago cutting and sticking in place. All those things that I placed there and then forgot about. In short, I am homesick and I'm time sick. I would be lying not to say that. It's possible to feel content and resolved and still be homesick. I miss all that no longer is, which is why I paste and piece all these scraps together. Sometimes I hold a ticket or photo, a piece of paper while willing myself back to where I first held it. I know that might sound silly, but it's what I do. I want to hear your young voices, the dog scratching to come in. I want to call my father on the telephone, finger in the rotary dial one number at a time, TW3-3642. Let me take this playbill and arrive at the theater or this receipt and find myself there in the produce aisle of Star Market. Then after the show, after I check out, after I sit and let the car warm up, I drive those familiar streets home and find everything just as I left it, the kitchen door creaking behind me. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes, this is where we would all clap. Um, <laughs> I see claps. <laughs> Thank you.
Oh gosh, I'm I am really grateful that you started with that passage because that line about being both homesick and timesick is one that I stopped and reread a few different times. Um, and as I was talking to Joe right before we started, the other line that did that to me in this first section when we get to know Lil is when she says, it's mysterious how fluid time has become for me. I wake and pour a glass and have no idea what I'll find. Um, and so, as you said, she's nearing the end of her life. You know, memory is something that is becoming more of a struggle and she's trying to piece together the, the story she wants to leave behind for her family. Um, it makes me want to ask a question that I usually ask much later in these conversations, but um, you have almost quilted together her narrative in this um, in this work. It's not it is not linear. Um, her memories and and rememberings come from all through time. How did you do that? <laughs> what was your process like in constructing Lil's voice in particular? You know, um, many of the pieces were written at a longer stretch together. Uh, and I knew that I was going to chop them up and, and splice them through. Uh, but a lot of times I would get into the rhythm of her voice, especially at a particular age. And I felt like I needed to see the sequence all the way through. So um, for those who don't know anything about the book, she and her husband um, kind of bonded over uh, this mutual loss. They both lost a parent in childhood and, and both in catastrophic ways. Uh, Lil's mother, uh, she was growing up in Massachusetts and her mother basically went out one night not saying where she was going and was at the Coconut Grove nightclub the night of the, the fire. And so there's so much that she doesn't know, you know, about her mother. And so some of the segments, like, like one time I just, did all these years of, of Lil ev every year on the night of the fire, at the time of the fire, she goes outside and sort of counts this 12 minutes, which is all it took for the place to go. Um, and, and, and so I wrote those together, you know, um, so that I had on my mind the date, the time, um, and then aged her through the years because it required a lot of research. You know, I was looking up what was the weather in Newton, Massachusetts on this night or um, what was going on, what television shows would her children have been, you know, through the window watching. Um, so it, it was fun to do, but it, it was it had a kind of analytical side to it that I had these sections um, is why those who were at the meeting this afternoon, we talked a little bit about, you know, my, my thought putting a novel together, I sometimes say assembly required. And it, it, it was very much like that, that I had all these different pieces of her life. Um, and then the challenge was determining the best order, you know, and, and, but you're, I, I really did do her in segments. And at, and at one time early on writing the book, I even wondered if it was going to be each character had a big section. Um, and then I really thought if I could get away with it, I wanted the effect of the fluidity of time and the way that we are in many ways controlled by our, by our memories. Um, you know, I have the two older characters, Lil and her husband, and then a young mother just right in the middle of life with a kid, you know, trying to make it all work. And of course the kid has, his only memory is that his dad isn't there anymore. You know, everything else for him is future and his mother is very much running from her past. That's the mystery there. And then Lil and her husband, Frank, are, 
you know, sort of turning and looking backwards in a way. So, so time was very much um, the motivating factor for, for um, wanting, wanting to write the novel in the first place. And you already mentioned that it's, it is rooted in two historical, you know, tragic events, one in North Carolina, one in Massachusetts. Um, one, one piece that really fascinated me is that um, all of the characters, um, the, the trauma that they carry, it happened when they were children, really. Um, and, and in Frank and Lil's case, they were not there. A big part of Lil's mission is to try to get as close as she can to that moment, um, whereas Frank doesn't, he has a different sort of response to, to the trauma and not being there. Um, but I was, I was struck by the, the way that that then tethers these characters to their childhoods, mm -hmm. um, even the ones who are grown. And it got me thinking a lot about um, children. I have a six-year-old myself, and I just couldn't love um, Harvey Moore. And I felt like you completely nailed what it must be like inside a six-year-old's head, um, living with one day in and day out. Um, and especially the way that children connect to little trinkets and treasures and objects in their immediate space. And so um, I guess I just wanted you to first maybe talk about how you accessed um, Harvey as a character and, and um, how you wrote him so beautifully, um, but also, you know, in sort of speaking to the way that Frank assigns so much meaning to objects, Lil assigns so much meaning to words, um, and Shelley too is trying to almost frantically write her way out of um, her childhood trauma too. Yes. Uh, that's like four different questions at once. So if you want to just start with Harvey, that would be great. Yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll start with Harvey. You know, I, I really love kid characters. Um, I often tell people I, and in most of my work there, there's, there's often a child and there's often someone nearing the end of life. I mean, I think those are the purest places of life, you know, because um, the kid's filter hasn't developed yet. At the other end, the filter has deteriorated or disappeared altogether. But there is this kind of freedom. There, there's a real freedom of thought and, and being able to voice it. Um, and I also really think, you know, that, that on some days, I think it comes down to those of us who never outgrew fifth grade humor and those who did, you know, and I, um, I still am quite a, um, quite a fan myself. I, I think that if we forget what it feels like to be a child, then maybe we've just forgotten what it feels like because there's, there's nothing purer um, than a child just completely loving and devoting devoted and, and trusting. Um, and, and the equal balance to that is, is the devastation that a child feels, you know, and we all, we all know that first time in life when it occurs to you that grown-ups make mistakes. Um, some kids learn it way too early, but, but we all know what that feels like and the shock of it. And I don't know that we ever get beyond that. You know, I think it is, it is a life shaper um, and we all have our stories to different degrees, but um, I, I find, I find I'm just fat, endlessly fascinated by those points in childhood that send someone in this direction or, or that. And, and so Harvey I had a lot of fun with Harvey because, you know, I sort of did the Ninja Turtle thing, but he also has like a petrified turd collection, you know, and his older brother has, has filled him up with all these local horror stories and, and murders, you know, so here he is six years old and he tells 
kids at school like about the Menendez brothers or Lizzie Borden. And, and so it, his mother is just having a really hard time with him. But at the same time, you know, he's just devoted to my little ponies and, and he loves, you know, the runaway bunny. And, and he's just, he sort of got a foot in both worlds. And I, I was trying um, early on, I, I knew I knew I needed to do a little more with Harvey. And, and today in class, I gave everyone a quiz where I sort of said, you know, name your favorite season, tell about a scar. And we just did this composite collection. And, and with Harvey, um, I decided he needed, he needed some kind of scar, you know, and, and, and I decided he, he was born, um, with the cleft lip and, and something that he has happily just gone through his life until, you know, kindergarten when he suddenly became aware, you know, and it's like Adam and Eve realizing they're naked. I mean, suddenly he realizes um, that people are looking at him or seeing him differently because of the scar. And, and so he has a, a fake mustache collection. I, I actually found this and could not resist. You know, I have this little <laughs> that I used on my book tour. Um, so I gave Harvey, you know, he has a fake mustache collection, which was loads of fun um, writing about that on the page. And he's created this superhero. And um, so I, I just had immense fun with him, but his sections are very, very short because I don't think I could have sustained um, that voice for too long. But, um, you know, I love, I love when you find something in, uh, interesting because um, suddenly I was looking up all the different kinds of mustaches, <laughs> you know, all the names like Fu Manchu, you know, which you could imagine. I mean, I, m my son is now, 30 and my daughter 33 but I suddenly had flashbacks of when they would get obsessed with something and know everything you know this is this kind of uh bird you know whatever pokemon whatever they were into they could just tell you everything and and they will they'll just keep telling you and they will keep <laughs> telling you <laughs> whether you want to hear it or not <sighs> Um, I'm curious about, um, so I, I, you, you said sort of the beginning of life and end of life, there's a purity there, you know, the filters are gone, the busyness of this middle part of life, um, is also gone. Um, I was really intrigued by the way that the children, Frank and Lil's children are and are not in the story. Um, and I'm wondering if you ever thought about giving them part of the narrative or if there were other characters that at one point had part of the narrative that then you later removed. Yeah, you, you are just, I can tell you were the English teacher. <laughs> um, yes, all the way, all the way around. Um, it, it was getting so complicated with their kids. It, it just over time, um, they became those characters always off stage. And yet we feel like we know them, you know, it's like Vera on Cheers, you know, Norm's wife, you know, or all these, all these characters um, that people talk about. And of course, she's writing these letters to them and she's recalling huge sections of their childhood. So you actually get to know them. But you only know them from the mother's point of view. And somehow that seemed important um, to her that, that we only have her version at this point. Um, so I made that choice. And then I actually had two other people um, in this community and they were some of the first characters I had. And you know, about a year in, I'm like, you know, I, I think you guys have your, your own novel. <laughs> so 
they're they're perking um that you know they have their own story it just took a very different their story was just too different and mm -hmm. it was it would have been like a pile up you know to have their thematic connection the same as like Lil and Frank or um, I felt I had enough on the page mm -hmm. well I I do think it's it has a striking effect um because it it highlights this idea that um Lil and Frank will never really know what it is that they want to know about their parents who were gone right. um but we also see that you know, there are pieces of um, their own children that they also may ne never know. Um, and so you see the reverse of that as well. Um, and I think, I think that is, I mean, may maybe, you know, someone will, will disagree here, but I, I feel that there, that it's almost impossible to fully know, um, you know, the same way we can't fully know who our parents were because we, we only know what we've been told, what we imagine, what we draw from photographs. And in the same way, you know, our children, um, they have all these dimensions, you know, that we, it, sometimes it's hard to see because you're seeing through the lens of, of a parent. Mm -hmm. Yes, that. I'm going to try not to be too heartbroken or terrified about that at the moment. <laughs> but I think you're right. Um, I am wondering before we keep going, folks who are here, please, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the chat. Um, Jill, I'm wondering if you would do us the honor of reading another passage from one of your other characters. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll read a tiny bit. Um, Harvey's first. Oh, good. Um, I won't. I won't do his turd collection. But, um, <laughs> <he's>, uh... <laughs> Harvey would be scared at night if he didn't have Peggy. She's fat and warm, and she snores, and sometimes her paws move like she's chasing something, like she will chase something if she needs to. And Harvey wakes her up to tell her to do it. But sometimes Harvey is the only one awake. And so he whispers in Peggy's ear to wake up just to make sure she will do it when he needs her to. Her ear stinks a little in a good way, like how her neck smells under her collar, kind of like the school cafeteria and those big rolls on spaghetti day. His teacher held one up to the principal and said, do you think we feed these children enough starch? And does this sauce really count as a vegetable, really? Harry's teacher, Harvey's teacher said, really, really, when she thought you were lying. So you already did your work, she would say, really? You really want me to believe that? And they did want her to believe that because she's the youngest teacher at the school and has a convertible and a boyfriend who makes beer. Somebody asked, did her boyfriend know she always eats lunch with Mr. Stone, the man who teaches second grade and runs the summer camp Harvey's mom is making him go to. The same kid asked, why didn't she dump her boyfriend and go with Mr. Stone? She already has everything anybody wants, a car and a dog, a pit bull mix named Susie, but Mr. Stone can dance and he wears cool shoes. Harvey kisses Peggy and smells inside her big soft ear. He keeps his eyes closed and pulls Peggy tight when he hears the back door open and close. He knew it would. Peggy doesn't wake up and Harvey's mom doesn't wake up. Just Harvey knows someone's in the house and in the hall and whoever it is stops and stands in the door just like last time. He wants to look, but he's scared to because there's some ghosts that'll blind you for looking and cut out your tongue too. So he just breathes real quiet into Peggy's soft ear and waits. Sweet Harvey. Um, and I, I just have to say too, I really was grateful for Mr. Stone, um, oh. the teacher who enters Harvey's life and, and bless all the teachers, especially the teachers of six-year-olds. <laughs> Oh, I feel that way. <laughs> I definitely feel that way. And actually, um, Ned Stone is a carryover 
also from life after life. Um, so yes, I, I have fun sometimes, you know, in this world, letting characters who did not have a very big role over here, they sort of take in a new part. Yes, and, and the, the two or more that are percolating for the, for the next one. Yes. That yes. didn't make it, yes. Um, so let's, let's talk for just a minute about um, Frank and um, who really, you know, the title is hieroglyphics and, and he in a lot of ways has very concretely tried to um, dig into the past as much as he possibly can. He's an archeologist, um, you know, has taught as a professor for many, many years. Um, can you just share a little bit about his character development and where he came from and, and what it was like writing him as well? Yeah, I mean, he, he was the hardest and, and not, not just because he's a man, but um, the great difficulty of um, creating a character who, who is much smarter than I will ever be in a particular topic. You know, he's, he's taught archaeology courses all these years and um, just a whole different sense of things. So it, it was exciting to, to do a lot of the reading, you know, and look things up and, and, and just try to find details that, that I thought he would have found um, interesting you know, to bring that language to the page and those images and as, and, and kind of to show his, his expertise. But this is a man who has spent much of his career, you know, talking about burial practices and, and all of the rites around death and the various rituals, and yet has, has really not been willing to look back too much on his own childhood. You know, Lil has sort of prompted him to, to look. His dad, um, the, the Coconut Grove fire was in 1942. And in 1943, around the same time of year, um, well, the, the fire was late November and, and this train wreck was, you know, early December right there in Robeson County, where I grew up, um, a train coming from Florida up to New England, many of the passengers on the train were actually from Lowell, Massachusetts. So there was a lot of overlap with these two accidents. And, and both of the accidents were like dominoes, just a series of failures, um, human error in, in large part, and a series of those mistakes. And, and what connected me to, to both accidents, and I'm getting a little off, off track here, sorry, but it's hard not, I almost said derail. I'm like, don't <laughs> say derail. And then I say off track. Um, but what really drew me to, to reading in the reading about both of those accidents is that in the aftermath, you know, here you can imagine people relying on telegrams, um, just finding people, identifying people, contacting family. And so the, in both cases, there was a, a long period of waiting where people had no idea what they would learn. And, and when you read the accounts of these accidents, you, you come to the, these pages um, of just cataloged descriptions of how they identified people, you know? So yeah, um, it was a scar, uh, a necklace, a, a shoe, a purse, a dry cleaning tag, and, and you just read these page after page of those little, you know, items that we often take for granted. And yet in, in, in the aftermath of such a situation, a whole life is represented by that artifact. 
and and so I I saw them as artifacts. Um, I mean, I you know it's hard to see anything like the the nine eleven presentation or to hear about um, you know that shirt factory fire years ago. I mean, wh where um, that's always the the story. You know, these little these bits and pieces that we take for granted. You know, you get up in the morning and you put things in your pocket or you have a note and you stick it in your pocket and you uh, you often don't think a thing of it. Um, but then it becomes something really valuable. Mm -hmm. And and so the whole notion of an artifact and how how a future generation will translate what got left behind either on purpose or accidentally is fascinating. And, and I think as we all, um, I'm always interested in, in what does not get said, you know, and, and we all as individuals have those long lists of the things we wish we had said and didn't, you know, and we edit scenes in life. Um, so there's that whole scope of what did not happen. And yet within, within our lives, um, it's, those are vital parts. It's as if they did happen because somehow thinking through things, the imagination, um, the imagination is powerful in its own way. And, and you put imagination and memory together and I think, I think that's what we're made of, right? <laughs> and we sort of move between the two, the reality, um, you know, and the hope or, or desire. And, and so his, his whole field of, of um, you know, a dig or what you might unearth and try to understand um, was, was the motivating factor but he he was my hardest character and he was you know a little um he's very com compartmentalized you know yes because I was going to say he, he you describe him as brilliant but he also um makes some you know I don't know if boneheaded is the right is right word but he makes mistakes too yes he does yes uh, he does and she and she she could not get over that. <laughs> she did spend a lot of time percolating on that. Yeah, um, that old tension for sure. Yes, we have um, some great questions that have come through. So I'm going to try to get to these um, as best I can. Um, and and one um, sort of ties into what you were just talking about. This question's from Anne, um, and it's it's a kind of a process question, but it's, you know, how often do you work hard to connect the themes among your characters versus when they emerge unconsciously or spontaneously? You know, how often is it you sort of putting a theme on your characters versus it, it arising from the writing itself? You know, I, I prefer when, when it arises on, on its own. And um, there are ways that you can go in and certainly tweak the connections. Um, and I mean, there, there are those times when I'm, I'm trying to think of an example where, you know, I selectively chose a memory of Lil's to create because it's somehow connected with where her children were. Um, but for the most part, those connections start to, sh they're, they're not always full blown, but I guess what I see over time is the potential to connect dots. Um, the, the same way that I believe, um, I, I keep telling myself, the, the wonderful thing about getting older is that with each year and that added distance, more dots start to connect, you know? And the cause and effect can't help but show. And, and so in that, in that same way, when I'm writing, I think I, 
I'm just sort of tuned in to where, oh, well, you know, maybe this is the same person, you know, that, that Shelly meets here. Maybe this person is, is from over here. Um, so I, I try, I hope that it comes out organically and naturally first. It, yes, and Sharon asks a question that um, is probably a part of that process, which is how involved is your editor in, um, in what does that process look like? The yeah, you know, and I, I, um, I had worked my whole career with Shannon Ravenel, who's a wonderful editor, and she retired before th this novel, Hieroglyphics, and I worked with Kathy Pores, and um, it was wonderful. We, we got along great, and I, I think what I get from an editor like those two is just the very careful reading and the honesty of, um, I don't know if this works, you know, or this is too much. And, and for instance, in Shelley's story, um, it was a little overwritten because I, I felt compelled to show more of what had happened to her. Mm -hmm. And my editor felt that less was more there that the ambiguity was more distressing in a certain way. And she was, she was right. Mm -hmm. And, and um, as soon as I had the distance and heard her, I could totally see that. I also had um, the older brother as character and then chose to pull him out completely in many ways he functioned as a kind of um scaffolding to get where I needed to go and and I think that a lot of times I I always tell my students there's a lot we have to write in order to get where we need to be and so you should never think of it as wasted material or wasted time if if this scaffolding you've built needs to come down. Yeah. <laughs> and that is where I do keep a pile of the recyclables, you know, to, to go back and reclaim, or I just allow myself to think um, it's the phantom, it's the phantom sections, you know, of the novel. They, they actually are there in my mind, but um, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Well, Chris asks, um, are you ever discouraged with the complexity of assembling your novels? And have you ever just totally abandoned a project or maybe put it aside for later? Yeah, I mean, I prefer to say put it aside for later. I have most definitely abandoned. And in fact, recently I went back and started looking at um, a novel I was working on now 20 years ago. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe I could do it now you know I mean I really do think that some of these things are out of our hands and and sometimes there are stories we're just not ready to write um and a lot of times I have had ideas uh that I just could not get off the ground only to circle back you know later and find just the right place or, or trying to write a story and it never works. And then I take that character and plug her into a novel and it works. Um, so I don't think anything is, is ever wasted, but a lot, there's a lot of rearranging. Um, I have two sort of tactical process questions from Tara and Jennifer um, that have to do with the practice of writing. So when do you like to write? Do you write on the computer? Um, do you have any rituals or patterns um, that help you get into the groove? What is the, what does the day in and day out look like for you writing? Yeah, you know, uh, on an ideal day, I mean, I'm, I'm an early, early morning person that's my favorite I mean if if you know the 
if if I was doing like, you know, the writing retreat and could have it absolutely perfect, I would, you know, get up at 530 and start writing by, you know, 615 and go until noon. And, um, you know, all these years teaching, I, I haven't always had that luxury, but I do the get up early. And, you know, even if it's just like, you know, 20 minutes to sort of sit and reread what was written the day before or, or to look at notes and then also to sort of do the same thing at the end of the day, because I'm a big note taker. I love longhand. I like being portable. Um, so, so I always have, I love these little things that are sticky, the post-its that are this big and the bigger ones, you know, because um, then I can stick them in the right place on, on a page maybe where I have other information about something. And, and so I just accumulate like that and work in patches like that. I, I do love kind of sketching ideas longhand and then I have something to follow when I sit down to write. Um, and, and then, you know, much of the real writing happens. I, I always want to say the typewriter, the computer, the keyboard. Um, but I, I don't edit on the screen unless I have, you know, gone through the hard copy with, with pen. I mean, you've taught, many of you have probably taught. I mean, it's just, it's, it's hard to ever not do that. And I see things so clearly and it's really hard as a writer to be objective about your own work. But, but if you can just say, well, you know, if you can kind of convince yourself you're reading, you're reading the work of someone else you know, that just landed on your desk and get that pen uncapped and ready to go. And so I try to do that and just go through and then I sit down again and type in those edits. And each time I go back in with edits, new things happen, new things grow. Um, this is why I said in, in the class earlier today, I really, um, I caution people that, you know, don't let go of it too fast. You know, there, there's, there's no, there's no replacement for real time and the time that, that you might let something sit a day or two so that you can come back and see it clearly. Um, and, and I can't count the times I've come back and said, oh, I'm so glad I didn't send that somewhere. You know, um, my, my rule is anything that gives me that sort of involuntary, um, I take it out because that's only going to get worse. <laughs> and, you know, I have published pieces that I'm like, oh, I needed to hold on to that longer. You know, it's um, so, so. That's, that's when um, whoever asked the question about, you know, making these thematic connections, I think that's the point in the revision process when, I'm, when I can see those um, possibilities. And I can promise you that if you've done the homework, really engaging your senses in the other pieces that are there, it, it will happen. I mean, thematically things will present, you know, and you're like, oh, I used that movie, the title of that movie, but oh, it would be a lot more effective if they had gone to see this movie, you know, or, or maybe you rethink the weather, you know, um, the writer Dick Bausch always does this wonderful thing where he talks about how, you know, okay, this this terrible thing has happened. You know, do do you do you let it rain um, to feed the atmosphere and and you know go along with it, or do you make it an absolutely beautiful day and go the ironic path? 
I mean, th those are the kinds of choices you can make. And, and they make striking differences in the way we feel um, as we experience it. So in that way, I think that's when I'm, I'm really thinking about theme. Um, and I love revision. It's my favorite part of the process. Students go running from the room, but, but I really believe that anyone who invests and decides this is what they want to do, you know, you, you have to um, love that part of the process. I mean, I think that's the real art, in fact. I mean, I think, I think that rough draft and the initial idea, I always tell people that's, that's falling in love, that's infatuation. And the revision is the real relationship. And that's when you got to sit down and say, okay, what can I live with? What can I not live with? <laughs> you know, we're, we're going to put it on the table and we're going to work it out right now. <laughs> and we're going to agree and make it work. We're going to make it the best it can be. Um, so they're, they're both exciting in their own way, but, but you can't, you know, that second part really needs to happen for it to, to have longevity. I've got one more question from Lisa and then I'm, I'm gonna wrap up with one more question of my own and then we'll, we'll call it a night. Um, but Lisa says, during the workshop today, you talked about the fact that all great stories are about leaving home or returning home, sort of hero's quest notion there. Um, going back to a house that we've once lived in, I think is a desire that many of us have had. When you were assembling this novel, was this an early idea or something woven in later? And it makes me think too of Lil, who is in late life leaving home and Frank who in childhood after this traumatic event is plucked from home and doesn't really go back until he's much older. Um, so that's, uh, that's another thread, but um, when did that emerge in the pro in the writing? That was there from the, from the very beginning. Um, part of the prompts, the list that I gave people was I, and I've done this for over 30 years with my classes, I would say, okay, I'm going to put a word on the board. And when you see it, write down every adjective, every image that comes to mind. And then I would write the word home. And as I told them today, after 30 years of teaching, um, what I got more than anything, I mean, occasionally, you know, you got the kid, I am from Texas, our state bird is, blah, blah. And I'm kind of like, okay, you might want to go over to the business school. Um, <laughs> I didn't really say that. But um, more often than not, what, what I got were um, childhood beds, kitchen tables, trees, um, a grandparent's house, these places of comfort and also places of um, kind of this individuality, you know, places where um, home, I started to think home was kind of connected with where you're totally yourself. You know, you close the door, you're totally yourself. And it's where we need to be um, as writers, but I found it so inspiring. And I had, I actually had Lil do the exercise. So, so in that first section, I read a few pages later, um, it begins, I hear the word home and I'm a child back in my bed. You know, I went to bed one way and woke up another. Um, but, but then it's just, uh, reaching to identify and recreate that childhood bedroom. And I guarantee you, if you ever have trouble falling asleep at night, pick a place far, far in your past and close your eyes and see that place. You know, walk the halls, look on the walls, look at the rug. Um, it's very satisfying. And and I often, um, I'm often surprised by things I do remember, you know, that I have not thought about. And um, so the home, the whole notion of home, um, because I think 
somebody else, there's some other saying about, I think it's a country, a country music. So where, you know, you're always longing for the home or then you get there and you're longing to stray. <laughs> oh, kind of the, how can I miss you if you won't go away? Um, but that coming and going. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I wish that we could talk for another hour, but I am mindful of the time. And so I will leave um, everyone with the, the question that I love to ask that we ask all of our guests, which is what are you reading right now? And what are you excited to read? Yes. Well, I, I cannot wait to read um, Honoree Jeffers, the love song of W.B. I never can say the name right. Du, du Bois. Du Bois. Du Bois. And <laughs> um, I'm very excited about that. I'm excited about Wiley Cash's new novel that's just coming out. Um, and I'm right now reading a short story collection that won't come out until spring, Megan Mayhew Bergman. But I mentioned in the group, I'm very excited. Lily King has a book coming in the spring. Um, and I'm trying to think what else. Just a lot of times I, I enjoy reading nonfiction um, when I'm when I'm writing a lot. And so I recently read um, The Truth at the Heart of the Lie by James Carroll about just um, the history of the Catholic Church scandals, uh, which is very well researched and fascinating and, and sort of took my mind completely far, far away from what I was working on, which some Sometimes is um, it's, it's a good thing. Yes, and then the poet Rita Dove has a brand new collection. Um, so I I love to read poetry as well. Mm. Yes, it well it has that um, the granular sensory the the attention and then the the precision of language that is present in your work as well. Thank you. No, I always tell my students it's a great learning exercise to read short stories or a poem with that turn in mind because you know you you get this concentrated experience of what you're trying to do with bigger bigger shapes and forms that doesn't change sorry i could talk all night I, covid has left me starved for classroom <laughs> conversation and beth you have just um, presented such wonderful questions and you the the questions coming from the audience um I feel like I could go right right now actually <laughs> well I I will say that the the gift was mutual here again as one living entirely in the thick of it this was such a lovely hour to just sit at your feet and hear um the stories behind the stories um this has been such an honor and such a such a treat. And to all of you who are here, to Charlotte Writers Club, um, Ada at Main Street Books, thank you all so much for being here. If you have not yet read Hieroglyphics, um, how could you not after this conversation? Um, and Jill, we look forward to the next time and I hope that it will be in our bookstore. Thank you. I, I really look forward to being there in person. And again, guys, I mean, it is Saturday night. I am really honored you're here. <laughs> So thank you. And thank you, Beth. Next time in person. Next time in person. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you.